annual Grand Champ uh, student, what a student of it, <laughs> the uh, Senate Faculty professional staff, Senate Grand Champ. I've written that on the times. Um, this is the third one. It's named after someone no, no, uh, none of them I've ever heard of. But, yeah, yeah, it is. You know. yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah. thank you for coming. And um, you said we, we instituted this, the Senate did, uh, a number of years ago in order to sort of feature the kind of research and practice that uh, many of our great faculty and professional staff do all year round and uh, contribute to the community as well as of course work with our students. So we're really happy this year to have chosen Dan Gilbert as our third recipient, our third lecturer. And um, again, most of you probably know Dan, but just to uh, mention a couple of, he, um, was a faculty member here way back, 1969. Not quite where Jim Peltier or Al, but you know, close, close, close enough. So close enough. Close. He's been here a long time. And, um, I don't think he had gray hair at the time, nor certainly I didn't either. Anyway, that, that happens over here. Um, he, uh, again, uh, he's a, uh, a graduate of Harvard College, undergraduate, and got his PhD in sociology at Northeastern. University and his district, some of the research he's going to talk about today comes out of his uh, dissertation. It's always a nice thing when you do this research to share it with folks. Okay. Um, it's a very important topic, uh, both um, historically but certainly currently, have to do with welfare myths and uh, realities. Sadly, uh, welfare is still with us. Um, and. Uh, one of the things that Dan has done, along with his wife Marlene, that founded the Coalition for Social Justice in this area, which has become, I think, a rather a very important and a powerful group. Uh, I mentioned that the politicians, when they make those calls, they, they tend to come. You know, if you ever attended their banquets, they're all there. So that shows the kind of work that they've done and very important work in this area to at least help uh, elevate uh, the economy of this, uh, and help uh, people's lives uh, in this area. So we really thank them for that work. And in any case, without further ado, I'll introduce Dan. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me up top? Yes. So hello everybody, all my friends. And uh, it's very, pre very much appreciate being invited to do this. Um, and uh, to be associated with the name Gene Grandchamp, who I've talked with for over 30 years. And thank you for the subcommittee of Ron and Jim Pelletier and Martha that made the selection. Um, ironically, this is research that I did in, back in the 1990s when I got my PhD. I didn't do it originally when I started teach here. I went back for my PhD later on in my 40s. And, uh, but I've never talked about this with any other faculty. I don't know if anybody here has ever really knows about this research at all. My students know about it because I share with them a newspaper article from the Fall River Herald News, which is a summary of it, that I, an op-ed that I did at around that time. And I have copies here if people want a copy afterwards for souvenir. But uh, so anyway, it's nice to be able to have a chance to talk a little bit about this. And I, I'm going to be doing two things. One is talking a little bit about the subject matter itself, the subject matter of welfare and particularly from an historical point of view because welfare reform was put in the mid-1990s and the research that I did was right before that. So it, it gives you an idea of a picture of what was really going on versus the assumptions that were made at that time. Um, I think it has com contemporary relevance. Um, as Ron was saying, the issue is still with us. In fact, in the current uh, budget that's proposed before the uh, House of Representatives of the state legislature, they proposed uh, elimination of the transportation allowance for welfare recipients who were engaged in work activities or education. And it looks like that's probably gonna pass through that part of the legislature. Um, they're talking about photo ID cards for people with EBT, food stamps or, or cash benefits. Um, even though studies have been done that indicate that there is no advantage whatsoever in terms of fraud 
and it costs money for the state at a time when the state is short of it, but to look like they're being tough on welfare, they need to vote for this. And that's been the, basically what's been going on in one form or another since the 1990s. It just never stops. And so the demonization of welfare is something that was developed originally by Republicans uh, as a way of cutting into support for the Democratic Party. And then many, of the, many Democrats jumped on board and ended up supporting it, feeling that otherwise they would look soft on the issue and they want to appropriate for themselves. And that included Bill Clinton, who signed the um, welfare reform bill nationally in 1996 it included John Kerry who voted for it in 1996 and I don't think it's because they ideologically believed in what they voted for I think it's because they sensed that the American public was anti-welfare and we need to cater to that prejudice um, so my, my, my purpose in the research that I was doing was to take that prejudice on and to try to do something to try to investigate what was going on beyond what I had seen so far in the research literature. And my starting point was um, having been a teacher at BCC teaching intro to sociology and social problems classes um, and having a lot of welfare recipients in my classes back in those days because of the welfare rules, many more recipients were able to come to community college and we actually had five to seven hundred welfare recipients a year enrolled at BCC. And so I would have discussions with people in class about why people use welfare, and what their experiences were, and I often had students that had, that had that personal experience and they would share with the class in some cases, and sometimes I talked to people out of class as well. And those dialogues gave me a real insight into what was going on. So I can say that my starting point in many ways, aside from my general philosophy of politically and, and socially, it started from the discussions that I had with those students. And so I entered this research that I was doing with a major interest in that subject at the same time with some initial assumptions that I then needed to test out empirically. I'm not gonna go through the welfare myths that um, extensively because I don't have time. A lot of this is going to be pretty rushed and so I'm just going to hit some highlights. But I think you probably know that welfare has been demonized heavily in our society. And I think the central, and I say myth about welfare, is that welfare recipients use welfare because they're lazy and would prefer to sponge off the system to work. I'm putting it right out there. That's really what a lot of people say and it's fairly fashionable to say it. Um, it's, a lot of people do not think that's a prejudice, they think that's a fact. Um, there are some individual recipients who are not that hard working, but there's individual everybody's that not that hard working. We know that from our students, we know that from ourselves. In any population of people, there's va variation. But to classify an entire group as lazy and not wanting to work is a stereotype, pure and simple. And over and above that, when you start to analyze why people use welfare, what you find out is that there's very, very compelling reasons. There's very few people that are using welfare simply because they are lazy and do not want to work. Even people that uh, are on the lazy side, if they can do a lot better economically by working, they will, they will work. They may not do a very good job of working, but they'll, try, they'll work because they can do better. And on the other hand, people that are oriented toward, toward um, toward working will oftentimes find that based on the circumstance of their lives that they have to use welfare because the only way they support their family. It's the best option for them given this, this constraints that they face. And so that was the assumption that I entered this with. Um, partly again based on those conversations with students. I asked one student for example, I remember very vividly in my class, why did you go on welfare? And she said, well I was working and my mother was taking care of my child, my children actually, two, two small children, and she got a job and I had nowhere to put the kids. And so I went on welfare because of that. And then she came to BCC and in those days because of the rules, she could spend a time, enough time to graduate from BCC and go on to a four year college while she was on welfare. That no longer is the case. Um, but that was you know, the kind of answers that I got and it sounded right to me. So I wanted to test this out. Um, a couple of other things I wanna mention on this list though. The assumption when the welfare reform was passed was, one, one assumption was once on welfare, always on welfare. In other words, you've got, you're talking about the problem of welfare lifers, that people would just stay on welfare year after year after year. 
And just statistically, at that time, one out of 12 welfare recipients had been on welfare for 10 or more years. 11 out of 12 got off of welfare within 10 years. More than 50% of all welfare recipients got off within two years. Those were facts before we ever had a time limit, before people were forced off the rolls. So you see, you know, initially just looking at some basic facts, it called some of these assumptions into question. Um, another example of this is that uh, welfare use was skyrocketing and that we, to keep it down and to keep tax dollars down that we had to limit use. So as it turns out, when you look at the numbers, that the amount that was being spent on welfare was an increasingly small portion of the federal budget throughout the 70s and 80s leading up to welfare reform. The reason for that was a small proportion of single mothers were using welfare. The reason for that was that the welfare grants were not being increased with the cost of living. And so increasingly it became impossible to survive on welfare, even for low wage workers. And they ended up working rather than being on welfare because it was their best option. The fact of the matter was on their own, people were getting off welfare. Not a great choice given the, the level of education and kind of job that people were often taking, but nevertheless they were doing it on their own before the time limits ever were put through. Uh, the total amount that was spent at that time, and it's still it's slightly less today, was 1% of the federal budget. When I asked my students what percent do they think is spent on welfare, and some of these students are on welfare themselves, Others uh, have some familiarity with it, but basically people responding to media and they, something has trickled down even for the people that don't follow the media very closely. The majority of my students, I say, how many people think it's 1%? No one raises their hand, maybe one person. If it's one, by the way, I say, how do you know that? They say, oh, I was in Marlene Pollock's uh, <laughs> class or something like that. <laughs> um, how many think it's five? A few hands go up. How many think it's 10? A few hands go up. How many think it's 25? A few hands go up. It's one, less than one. It's, it, if, if welfare was eliminated tomorrow from the face of this country and we all got a tax rebate, which of course would not happen, but if we did, we would hardly notice the difference in our paychecks yeah. from week to week. Yeah. It's a trivial amount. And yet that is the impression that's been given because some, such a big deal has been made about it that I think logically speaking, people say it must be big because otherwise why is everybody talking about it all the time? So that gives you a little bit of a background. But let me jump in now into the research uh, to, to give you an idea of what I did. So what I did was to look at, I, I did a quantitative project based on the 1990 census. And the, the census every year, they won, 5% of all the families, they do a, um, an extensive um, questionnaire that's, that's deeper than the normal survey that they do for census. And they put this on, uh, on tape, and so you can, if you have the proper technology, you can dig into that data and do individual level correlations and statistical manipulation. And so you can develop a model to say, okay, what, what, why would people use welfare or why would people work based on looking at a variety of factors that might influence it. And for people that are familiar with statistics, which I'm not gonna assume anybody here is, basically there's a mathematical, you know, it's a, it's a mathematical equation that, you, that is developed for predicting based on the evidence, you know, how much does this factor contribute and how much does that factor contribute and how much does this one and how much that one. Some factors contribute very little, some contribute a lot. And you can get an idea from that, uh, it's called regression analysis, what, which, what, how much each variable contributes to the likelihood of welfare use or the likelihood of working, which to me is kind of the flip side of the same, the same thing. And so I basically did that. Um, and the computer did all the calculations, thank goodness for modern technology, and I was able to develop this mathematical model. So the first question was, what variables did I look at? Which, which things did I examine? So the first thing I looked at was anything that had to do with earnings potential. In other words, how much money can someone make? Because again, I knew from, from the conversations that I had with the welfare recipients in my classes, and it's just kind of common sense over and above that. <laughs> yeah. Marco Rubio. Right, exactly. <laughs> Did it look like that? I hope it wasn't quite as rushed. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, I knew from, from those conversations and from just general logic that if you can make more money at working, then you're less likely to use welfare. 
I know people are familiar with what welfare pays, but it's less than $600 a month if you have two kids. And so it's not exactly a, a tremendous benefit. And it never gets increased. In the state of Massachusetts, we've had one increase since 1988. It was 10%. The cost of living has doubled during that time. So every year, it's worth less than it was before. And so if somebody can make better money by working, they're going to choose to work. If they can make a little bit better money by working, they might choose welfare, however, because welf when you work, there's certain expenses you don't have when you don't work, like transportation or clothes for certain kinds of jobs, or child care, or things of that nature. Even if it's not full-scale child care, it might be babysitters or things like that. And so how much somebody can make, it seemed to me, should be central. And so one of the things I looked at was education. And another thing I looked at was language proficiency. To what extent could someone speak English fluently? Because that obviously there's a lot of jobs you're not going to be able to get if you don't speak English well in our society. I also looked at the impact of children and all the different issues involved with that. So for example, families, do, you have, do they have a young child or do they, are their children older? Do they have larger numbers of kids or smaller numbers of kids? That should affect welfare use as well. Uh, is there availability of childcare? And unfortunately, the data I had didn't tell very much about that, but it did tell you if there were other adult family members living in the home. And so that gave you a little idea that there might be resources available to help out with childcare. Um, I also looked at access to child support, and the reason that's important is because if you get child support, your welfare check increases by $50, and the rest of your child support is used to pay off your welfare check. And so let's say somebody gets $300 in child support, right, and your welfare check would have previously been $500, I mean $539, it goes up to $589. Right? But meanwhile, you've lost $250 worth of your child support. So it makes much more sense in most cases to get your child support and then use, and then even working a little, you're going to be well above the poverty, well above the welfare level. So child support access would be important. The impact of immigration, I didn't think that necessarily would really influence things, but I wanted to throw it in there because a lot of people have make assumptions about immigration and that people come to, come to this country to be able to collect welfare. And so I wanted to be able to test that. Recent immigrants should use welfare more if that assumption was true. Uh, the age of the mother, that's a factor that should influence things through, again, through earnings potential because older mothers have more work history and are going to be more employable than younger mothers. Uh, employers would rather have a more mature 30-year-old single mom than a less mature 20-year-old single mom, everything else being equal. And then marital history, what I mean by that is, are they never married or previously married? So you hear a lot about teen mothers having babies outside of wedlock and that that's the core of the dependency problem. Uh, so I wanted to test that out to see if that was a factor. So that was all pushed, put into this regression equation. The computer spit out the results. I did it for labor force participation. I did it for welfare to see what the results were. And then I did a racial comparison, which I'll talk about in a second. So one way, there's a lot of different ways to display the impact of variables, but one way would be to say, okay, if everybody was a certain way, but in every other respect, it was the same population you're dealing with, what effect would that have on labor force participation or welfare? So this was for labor force participation. If everyone in this group that I looked at, the thousand plus people that were in the data, had um, eight years or less education, which you, what would their welfare, would their labor force participation rate be? And the answer was 17%. So the very poorly educated aren't going to work much. They're going to use welfare most of the time. On the other hand, as you work your way up, you see for college graduates is 90%. And it goes up for every level of education. So anybody here that questions whether education makes a difference for the ability for single mothers to be able to work outside the home, this is proof positive. Very, very clear. And very major differences from one level to another. Education, by the way, turned out to be the supreme variable of anything that affected it affected welfare use. Another thing I looked at was the number of children. And so people that had one child, if everybody had one child, the predicted rate of labor force participation would be 70%. But if they had two children, it went down to 59. And this is interesting. The difference between one and two children affects it quite a bit, right? Because it's easier when you have one child to figure out where you're going to put that child than if you have two, right? Two children are usually different ages. There's more of them. 
So you can swing it with one, it's more difficult to swing it with two. And so you can understand that, um, that that might be a difference. I've never seen that actually talked about at all. You know, when you think of larger families, we think of big families like four or more kids. This is the difference between one and two. That should make a difference according to this. Another factor was, do you have younger children or children six, six or older? And there was somewhat of a difference between the two, although not as much as I thought there would end up being. Another was, were there adults being present in the household? That might again provide resources for taking care of the kids so that somebody could go to work and so on. And that ended up being a somewhat of a difference, but not as much as I expected as well. Probably part of the problem here is that a lot of times when people depend on other adults, that the other adults don't live in the same home. For example, a lot of people rely on sisters. And, but sisters oftentimes have their own lives and they have their own households, so that wouldn't have figured into the, fig, into the information that I had. If I knew how many extended family adults helped out, I would be, be, had much better information, but that's not in the census. Never married versus previously married. Look at how close those figures are. Apparently, it didn't make a whole lot of difference whether you were never married or previously married for labor force participation, only a four point difference. Age of the mother did make a difference. Again, that's related to earnings potential. 10% difference in labor force participation. Has access to other family personal income, including child support, a seven point difference. Being a recent immigrant versus a longer term immigrant, interesting, recent immigrants, every, all other variables controlled for, right, actually work more often than immigrants that have been here longer or native born with the same characteristics. Why? Well, first of all, most immigrants, if you're, not, if you're not a refugee or if you're not from Puerto Rico, who are not te technically immigrants, they're migrants from a ter U.S. territory, you're not eligible for welfare benefits for five years. So coming to this country to collect welfare doesn't make sense, at least for five years. Mm -hmm. And secondly, most come with the philosophy of working, 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 and you get as many people as possible in the family to work as you possibly can, right? And based on expectations for what you're gonna get, where your reference point is where you came from, not the, the average wage in the United States. So it may be a step up, even though for us it would be, most of us it would be a big step down. Yeah, this doesn't include the so-called legal workers. What'd you say? These are not, this does not include the legal workers. It's not on, on the, in the stats, right? Say it again. You're saying legal, legal, this legal doesn't include the legal workers. Yeah, I'm not even talking about that. Yeah, just uh, immigrants. I mean, they didn't make a distinction, but I'm sure overwhelmingly these were legal immigrants. Um, language proficiency, 64% versus 47%. That's a big difference, and again, relates to the kind of jobs that people can get. So that gives you a feeling for the impact of these variables. When I ran an, a regression equation with all these variables, and I said, what's the likelihood of using welfare? I could predict about 88% of the people, whether they use welfare or not, simply based on these variables. Now, none of these had to do with, because the underlying assumption is its character. It's the belief in hard work. It's the value of hard work. It's, it's how responsible you are. It's how much you're willing to defer to the future. It's the assumption is those are the reasons why people choose welfare. And yet, this said, if you know the person's objective circumstances, you can predict close to 90% of the time, based on the inadequate information that I had, whether someone uses welfare or not. Once you know the objective realities, it pretty much tells you the story, with the exception of some borderline cases. Okay, so then I looked at racial differences. And so I looked at black-white differences and I looked at Latino-white differences. There were also some Native Americans and Asians in the sample, but it was too small to be able to come up with any real conclusions. If we'd done New York City, there would have been big enough samples, but for Boston, it wasn't big enough. I don't think I even said this was Boston. So anyway, this is a study of Boston. Um, so for welfare use, spelled, misspelled, um, very interesting. Black women, black single mothers used welfare the least. White single mothers used welfare next most. And Latinos used welfare quite a bit more than both. Now that's not what people assume, would assume. It would be assumed that white single mothers would use it the least, then blacks, then Latinos, based on, the, based on popular assumptions, or maybe even let blacks more than Latinos, depending who you're talking to. Uh, but that was the actual figures. And in terms of labor force participation, not quite as stark, but even there, black single mothers work more often than white single mothers, and also substantially more than Latinos. So 
There were two, so I didn't mention in the beginning, but one of the assumptions about welfare that goes on is that it's the connection with welfare and race. There is, there are, welfare is demonized, but we also have racial stereotyping. And so the assumption is, because th this lazy and not wanting to work stereotype is applied heavily to the black community as a whole or the Latinas as a whole, not just to welfare recipients. And so the two intersect with one another. So people oftentimes assume that it would be, the face of welfare, the, of the lazy welfare recipient would be a black single mom with lots of kids or Latina single mom with lots of kids. And um, apparently, at least in terms of blacks and whites, that was not the case in the city of Boston. It was the opposite. I didn't expect that result, by the way. I thought there would still be a higher rate of black uh, use. I didn't think it would be a lot higher, but I thought it would be higher. Um, but that's how it came out. So then the question became, how do we explain this? What are the factors? So one issue is the black-white comparison. I'm not going to say much about that at this point, except to say that I don't really know the answer to how why it came out that way because I didn't have the information. If I was going to, if this research had been the beginning of a career doing research, I would have done some more research to find that out. But this was a one-shot deal. I, by, I've, this is the only research I've ever done. If it's serious research, you know, I'm a teacher just like every, most people here. I'm not a researcher. I never pursued this beyond my PhD. But that would have been the kind of thing I would have pursued. There was enough questions coming out of this, I could have made a career out of it if that was me and I had the opportunity. Um, but the, quickly, uh, the reason, some of, some of the speculative reasons for it, one is that there might have been factors that I just didn't put into the equation that could help explain it, like the access to extended family resources. So a lot of black women have sisters they rely on, but the sisters don't live in the home and they're not reflected in the, in the information that I had. That would help explain it. A related factor, number three here, is that the black community historically has developed strategies for coping with extreme racism. Because black men have not been able to support their families going back to right after slavery and right up to the current day, right? And so black women have had to participate in the labor force. And if that's the case, somebody's got to take the kids. And so there's been a collective sharing of responsibility for taking kids. Some people place that in the history in Africa, but I, I don't know if it goes back that far or not. There's no question, though, that there's been a strategy developed in the black community to cope with this reality for black men so that at a time when, for white women, the typical thing was to stay in the home, certainly when you had kids, the typical thing for black women was to work. I'm talking about in the 40s or the 50s or the 30s or the 20s. You know, so all of that may be coming into play in terms of the reliance on extended family resources and in terms of just the assumption that you, you do what you have to do to be able to work um, as, as a woman. Um, so that's, you know, I'm thinking that that's, may very well have been the case. The third factor is that if you look at the population of single mothers and where they live, white single mothers who are a little more educated, a little more advantaged, are more likely to live in the suburbs around Boston. But black single mothers who are more advantaged are going to live in Boston itself. I did a, another study in a summer research project, not, I wouldn't classify it as original research like this, but looked at the figures in the census as well, and what I found was that People that with middle class, upper middle class incomes, if they were black, tended to live in the city, and if they were white, they tended to live in the suburbs. And part of that has to do with obstacles in buying houses, uh, which we could talk about another time. In any case, those were my speculations, but like I say, I'm not sure what the reason is. What's interesting, though, is it certainly doesn't back up the stereotype that black women are lazy and don't want to work, or that black single moms will be lazier than white single moms, if anything, you would go the other direction if you wanted to think that way. And I don't think thinking that way is very helpful, so I'm not going to apply it. But that's, if, if you wanted to use that kind of approach, it would, be, it would be a case where you'd come up with the reverse of what the stereotype usually is. So meanwhile, let's take black, white Latino differences. Now, if you, as you recall, there was substantial differences between whites and Latinos. Latinos were much less likely to work and much more likely to use welfare. So the question would be, why? And so I looked at the different factors that might influence that, and based on 
the equations and so on, you could see what really made the difference. And there were four factors that contributed. The number one factor was clearly education differences. And I'm going to show what those differences were in a second. The second factor, which was also important, was differences in numbers of children. But interestingly enough, mostly between one and two children was what influenced it, rather than Latino families having, lar having large numbers of kids. But again, I'll go into that a little bit more. The third was differences in English language proficiency, which we already saw makes a big difference. And the fourth was getting child support, which for Latinos was about half as likely as for whites. So those four things explain the difference. Once you took those into account, you controlled for those variables, the, the, the rate of welfare use, the difference in the rate of welfare use disappeared. So black and Latino, single moms, everything else being equal, we're equally likely to use welfare, right? Black and, and white single moms, black single, white single mothers are more likely to use welfare. This gives you an idea of some of those differences. Um, as you see, for example, in terms of education, that would be the high school dropout population, 43% versus 29 or 25 for blacks and whites. Those push out push out, Marlene corrected me on this. Yes, there is a reality to that. Um, some co college or college degree, as you note, um, whites about twice as likely as Latinos to have some college or college degree. And note how high the figure is for black women, by the way. That's also more people that have gone to some college than college graduated, but black women in Boston are almost as educated as white, black single mothers, excuse me, are almost as educated as white single mothers. The difference in one child only, Latinos had one th two thirds with one child, I mean, excuse me. That's a incorrect figure. A third of the Latinos had, I'm gonna have to forget the figures here. I'll tell you that Latinos had, were skewed in the direction of having larger numbers of kids but the biggest difference was between one and two kids rather than four or more kids. And it shows here that 10% of Latinos had four or more kids, which is pretty, to me a pretty small percentage. It isn't gonna have a big impact on an entire group. That was compared to 4.5 for whites, so that was a factor, but not a significant factor. All right, and perceived child supports I already mentioned. Okay, so so basically what I did was able to discover, what'd you say? I said that was up there, that one. Yeah. So basically what I was able to discover from this was that the stereotypes about racial differences did not hold, nor did the stereotypes about individual differences hold, right? Individual differences between use welfare or not use welfare, work or not work, right? Again, looking at objective circumstances, looking at things like how, how much schooling people had, looking at things like what, how well did people speak English, looking at whether they had one versus two children, those kind of things explained most of the choice that people made when it came to working versus welfare on an individual level, and when it came to group differences, you could account for the Latino rate being higher by looking at the four factors that we just talked about, and if in terms of blacks and whites, black women actually were using welfare less, and we, I gave some ideas for why that was the case. So that was the research that I did, and I, you know, it was a modest contribution to trying to break down what I think is a lot of mythology about all of this. Um, I said one more comment and then I'm gonna open it up for questions. Um, this issue of single mother poverty, whether it be use of welfare, which by definition you have to be very poor if you're using welfare, or not using welfare but working in low wage jobs, the issue of single mother poverty is a very serious problem in our society. We have a lot of single mothers. Single mother families has, gone, has grown enormously over the years in every racial and ethnic group. Some groups it's still bigger than others, but it's big everywhere. And the fact is that the poverty rate for that, for that population is huge. It's almost 30%, um, and regardless of race. And so really, to me, the focus should be how could we overcome single parent mother poverty? 
with single parent poverty, right? What, what could we do to address that? What could we do in terms of creating new jobs? What could we do in terms of improving education and job training? What could we do in terms of more support for childcare? What could we do in terms of having more access to healthcare so people don't stay on welfare in order to get healthcare benefits? And by the way, on that, on that front, there has been significant progress made, unlike many others. Um, those would be the kind of things you would look at, I would think. Um, in terms of welfare, what I would say would, is the welfare system designed to help make single moms self-sufficient to be able to survive without getting cash benefits. And there it becomes pretty clear that education is the key and that you want to have a policy where people can get as many years of education as they possibly can. And that investment, which is made individually by the single mother or single father in question, or and is also made by for by society because society pays a limited cash benefit while people get their, get their education pays off many times over for both the individual and for society. Um, but the system that was adopted imposed a two-year time limit uh, which did not give enough time for people to finish their community college education. As you know, most of our students take three years, right? That's the median at BCC. And these are people, many of whom don't have the kids to deal with, right? Um, and certainly it doesn't enable you to go to a four-year college. In fact, going to a four-year college is not an approved education training program. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you go into welfare and you say, I got my community college degree, I want to get a degree from U.S. Dartmouth, can I spend my two years doing that? You're going to say, you can do it on your own, but meanwhile, you've got to do this work requirement. Mm -hmm. There's no time left to get your education. And so what would make most sense in terms of helping to get people off welfare is not being pursued. And I think, you know, in talking to legislators about this issue, most of them understand this, when I explain it to them at least, but they also feel like when these issues come up that they have to vote the anti-welfare way or otherwise people are going to accuse them of being soft on welfare. Because the media and some politicians have made so much hay over this issue that they've really created a bad name for this to the point where you never even increase the welfare grant to keep up with the cost of living. As I mentioned before, one increase, 10% in 25, 25 years. How do you justify something like that when people are trying to live off it? And it's people that are, have been deemed by society as being eligible for this program, but never, if you go to the legislature and, and talk about that, they will laugh you out of the room. Oh, we're not, no one's gonna support that. Spending extra tax dollars money for that? Forget about it. I think it's deserving, but they don't think it's deserving, or I don't think it's deserving either. Either way, they're not going to support it. So th this issue continues to the present day, although the data that, I, that I'm using for this study was, is 20 years old. So it's, like I say, it's more of an historical study than a study of now. Okay, so thank you very much. Jean. But odd that we talk so much nowadays about data driven analysis across the board. I mean, you know, governmentally, not just here at BCC. And w the research you were doing was going into welfare reform. And so it's almost like the government was exactly, but the government was basing this on the prejudices of the American people who saw welfare recipients as fitting certain stereotypes. That's right. Yeah. So. I guess this is the new age of data-driven reform, <laughs> you know, rather than popular prejudice reform. <laughs> I guess so. Or maybe not. I but don't it's know. all about morality. Mm. What'd you say? It's all about morality. Yeah, it is. It's saying we can't reward them for making bad choices. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of that. Right? Yeah, there right. is a lot of that. Yeah. Right. Jim? That's hard to what percentage of state mm -hmm. budget goes to all the what did she just say? What percentage of state budget goes to welfare? What percentage of the state budget goes towards welfare? Oh, the state of the state budget? Yeah. A little less than two percent. So the state, it's a little higher than federal, but not much. Yes. I remember reading years ago that perhaps five to seven percent of the people who are collecting welfare are cheats. And when I ask my class about that, and I say five to seven percent, they scoff at that. And I think what happened is scoff because they think it's higher, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah, they think it's much higher. Yeah. 
And I think we have the perception that every once in a while someone gets caught pulling up to the welfare office in a Cadillac or some other ostentatious show of wealth. What in your research has shown that, is that 5 to 7 percent an accurate figure, right. roughly, of people who are cheating welfare who should not be there, but they are collecting? So, so I didn't do any research on this. Um, I have some familiarity with different studies that have been done. And the welfare system has put all sorts of checks in place to eliminate fraud. So for example, you can't have multiple bank accounts now in different places and not declare them without their finding out about it. The bottom line, though, I think that any system that you have, you're going to have a certain amount of fraud. I don't care what program you're talking about. I mean, let, let me give an example, the unemployment benefit issue. What percentage of people that are collecting unemployment are declaring all of their income that they're making on the side so that the unemployment office will turn around and cut back the size of their unemployment check? Mm. Not too many, right? Or in the case of taxes, how many of us declare income if we have a choice of not declaring it? I mean, obviously, if BCC submits a W-2 that the federal government knows, but suppose it's a job on the side. Suppose it's a textbook publisher that comes around and gives us, what do you call them, um, desk copies, free copies to take a look at. And then a second-hand guy comes around and we sell them and make a few hundred dollars. Oh, yes, I'm going to go to the federal government and tell them that I made this this year. There is a lot of kind of what I call nickel and dime fraud that goes on in every system, and it goes on in welfare too. In terms of extreme examples, there are some as well, but I think there are a lot less. Um, I think actually, if you look at the main, the main problem in our, with, with welfare is not that people are, it's not that people are getting it who shouldn't be getting it, there are some. It's people are not getting it that should be. I think that's a bigger problem. Yes. I work with, um, particularly with adult basic education, I want to say two things. One, we haven't talked about the number of folks who, like we have a huge population in the state of Massachusetts who get a GED and do not come on to the community college. Only a small percentage of GED graduates actually come on to the community college. We have these small programs trying to encourage transition, but that's a huge population of people yes. who, because of many of the things that you recognize. So the other thing I would say is that I often say to people, in fact, everyone who's on public assistance has to cut, has to bend the rules some way because it's not enough to live on. That's right. And you don't have a choice. You can't get a job that gives you enough to live on. And at least the welfare system gives you medical benefits for your children and food stamps. So that everybody who is on welfare, just as with taxes, has to, in fact, bend the rules in some way because right. it's not enough to live on. Yeah, there was a study done by a woman named Catherine Eden who studied 50 welfare mothers, kind of case study in depth in Chicago. She wrote her book about it. And out of those 50, six of them were particularly impoverished, suffering from homelessness, suffering from kind of extreme, the extremes of extreme poverty. And what distinguished the six from the 44 was that the six didn't have any other source of income other than welfare, and that the 44 mostly did. And it was mostly working on the side or getting something from your parents or getting something from your boyfriend, boyfriend. right? Which, if I was in the same situation, I would do all of that. Absolutely. Because you, you try to do what's best for your kids and you need it. So and that, you know, most people understand that. That's not really what they mean when they talk about welfare fraud. What they're talking about is more serious kind of fraud. You're talking about, I mean, I know a case of a guy that has a professional level job and his wife th claims that he doesn't live in the household and he, she gets welfare benefits and then they use that to supplement their income. To me, that is a more out and out fraud example than the nickel and dime survival fraud that we're talking about right here. There's just not that many of those cases. Yes? I was going to say, when, you, when the students point to fraud, a lot of it is that the women will have boyfriends living with them. But that's, you know, and I always say to people, they're running out of food on the third week of the month. Exactly. And if the boyfriend can help and provide food for their kids, why is that such a terrible thing? So I think when they say, oh, the fraud is higher, that's what they're referring to, is that they're living with their boyfriends. So. Yes. Uh, in Belgium, maybe perhaps uh, 10, 15 years ago, there was a recommendation uh, that uh, all citizens, when they reach 18, would receive uh, monthly, uh, what, no matter uh, what their income, 
uh, would receive a stipend, let's say, of eight hundred dollars, uh, but they would they could work as much as they would uh, and gain as much as they would like. The eight hundred dollars was not taxable. Anything beyond that was taxable, and from the eight hundred dollars, it was expected that they would pay for uh, health care and so forth, all, all of those other kinds of things. Uh, eight hundred dollars, huh? <laughs> uh, no, uh, eight hundred dollars was then. Okay. Now. Yeah. And uh, that would, it How seems, long this forever. It's, it's, a, it's a lifetime stipend uh, when you reach 18. Uh, that would then, it seems to me, do away with any perceived uh, differences of, uh, uh, of, uh, of persons who uh, merit uh, uh, an award. <clears throat> yeah, the majority of the European countries use, give, a support, an allowance for each child. And it goes to everybody, the universal benefit. So the advantage of the universal benefit is it's not, you don't have to have proven you, you deserve it based on impoverishment. And so no one can say, well, why are they getting it when I'm not? Everybody just gets it. It's like Social Security, right? People don't begrudge the poor of getting Social Security because they're getting Social Security too. And so a lot of the European countries do that. They also have things like free universal access to childcare and, and free uh, medical for everyone. They have, in many ca cases, a year to 18 months of paid maternity leave or paternity leave, either one, um, which is at, at your normal pay. I mean, you know, there's a very different philosophy there about what the state should be providing. You know, it's, it's ironic because people will call the U.S. government a welfare state, and there is a certain amount of social welfare programs of which wo welfare itself, the welfare we're talking about, is a small piece. But the bottom line is there's a lot less than a lot of these other countries, and the other countries have higher tax rates in order to be able to pay for that, and people don't vote those tax rates down because they appreciate the benefits that they're getting from it. Uh, yes. Studies have shown that uh, that system was much less expensive uh, than uh, these systems uh, of welfare. Uh, and everyone had subsistence, at least, and uh, it, it, it continued. And everyone merited it at the age of 18, and it continued until then. Yeah. David? You mentioned education. You said you had a hard time convincing a lot of legislators that free education for these people would be a short term expense and a long-term benefit. Right. And they, won't, they will agree with you, but they won't support it. Right. Yeah, so just to elaborate on the education piece, so we're talking about, I mean, ideally you would have, first of all, good public schools mm -hmm. that people would come out, would be equipped to go to college and so on. And the reality is that a lot of the same women that become the most impoverished single mothers also grow up in communities where the schooling is inferior. Mm -hmm. Urban school districts, inner city schools within urban school districts, and so on. So then they come out, then they, then they go to the next stage, and the question is, what level of education can we give people to change their ability to, to you know, and that's the GED. Well, it's actually, it starts with literacy, which then it goes to GED, then it goes to community, community college and you go, you go up the line. And, um, but the philosophy of the uh, welfare reform that was implemented in Massachusetts and was that any job is better than no job. So basically rather than, so those people with GEDs, what they're being told when they go down to the welfare office is go into a short time, go, well go into a job search program where you're applying for lots and lots of jobs over and over and eventually maybe you can get a minimum wage job. Or get a, apply for one of the training programs that's available like, like certified uh, nurses, nursing assistants, CNA. And so you get tons of people being trained to work in nursing homes, which is better than minimum wage but not much. Very difficult job. Many of the shifts are 3 to 11 or 11 to 7, which is not geared for people that have kids. And, but that's, so you get, a, you get a glut of people with those degrees. Rather than saying, okay, let's help people take a longer term approach and invest in helping people eventually get a college education, which then can translate into the statistics that I just saw. You know, the fact that on their own, 90% of the college grad single mothers were not using welfare. What that says is that 
even without a prod, they were doing much better by working than they were doing on welfare, right? And even some college, it's like a college, community college degree or even people that didn't finish the degree, that made them much more desirable to employers. And so it made more, much more sense to encourage that. That has not been what the state of Massachusetts has done. Our organization fought for seven years to get education and training to count toward the work requirements. So instead of people having to do what is often make work 20 hours a week, not really learning anything that's of value in the long run, to be able to say, see, I'm working for my welfare check, the people instead could get it, do education and training. And after seven years, we did get an agreement that people could use 12 months of education and training toward the work requirement. And it took a seven year fight, and, and we still haven't gotten to the point where they will give any more than that. And again, four year college program is not included. It's not an option, period. Marlene? Well, just that I don't know if this happened to other people, but when welfare reform took place, uh, I had students who were in their uh, fourth semester, or going into their fourth semester, of graduating from BCC, who were pushed out of BCC mm -hmm. by their welfare worker mm -hmm. and told to get a job. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought that was the biggest sin. I mean, here they're like on the verge of, mm -hmm. of getting an associate's degree which would up their job potential, and they didn't care. They were just mm -hmm. pushing them out. The other thing I just wanted to say is, uh, I think if we had affordable daycare for all, now if you want to go on, uh, if you want to get child care, you call up the welfare office and they'll say the only way you can get child care is to go on welfare. And there's 30,000 families lined up on to, uh, for affordable child care that are not getting that. Mm -hmm. And where are these kids staying? You know, with elderly grandparents, with who knows, staying home alone? So if we, you know, took a, a you know, if we pass Governor Patrick's tax package and we could give uh, affordable child care, that would, that's a huge barrier <coughs> for people going to work. I mean, what do you do with your kids, right? Mm -hmm. And if they have good child care, then they're going to do better in school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Because you have the, the little kids learning stuff, right? Yes. Well, you, as you obviously know, the, uh, this is essentially a political question. Mm -hmm. Why do the politicians not support this? You know, the uh, programs that are obviously mitigated against what we're talking about, that's because they don't support the people on welfare or even, you know, people a little bit above that vote, right? The people who vote are the people in the suburbs who have the prejudices, and that's who they came to. We talked to the legislature, you know. Right. They, that's what they say. You know, you guys don't vote, so why should we support them? Yeah, it's, that is a big, big issue. Uh, the different rate in voting, that exists in different communities between suburbs and cities and within sections of cities. I mean, Steve knows from having run for office in Fall River, you know, how many more people vote in precinct, in, in Ward 9 up this way than vote in Ward 2, which is a working class area. It's not particularly, not necessarily even that many people on welfare, but it's just much, much less educated. And also there's issues around age. I mean, you see how, how unpolitical and anti-political our students are. And what's happening is the newer generation of people as they come into maturity are less focused on voting. The older folks who were raised under the New Deal and FDR, that influence, were heavy duty voters, made a religion of it, and they're dying off. And so every time there's a major election that's comparable, if you compare it one election to the next, each time it, the numbers go down. Uh, city elections, you know, all the major contested ones, you look at the graph and it's like this, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that is, so if any strategy to, a change, to change this has to involve voter empowerment, it has to involve a lot of education of voters of what's at stake, and then it has to involve uh, getting, getting people registered, getting people educated, getting people mobilized, and you have to have organizations that are prepared to put significant energy and resources into doing that. And that's a big job, and that's what the coalition I'm involved in has worked on. But it, you know, we, we make we make some progress, but a lot more people need to be involved in this effort. You know, the decline of the unions follows yes. as well. When thirty yes. percent of the workforce was unionized. Yes. They had an organization. Now it's eight percent. Very much so. Right, because unions tend to educate their members, the members understand the relevance of the politics and based on, even though unions themselves are having some difficulty with their own members, but there's no question that being in a union makes you more likely to have some education around these issues and to be, to be active. Yeah, I know that you know, MTA, you know, we were making phone calls for Elizabeth Warren, got her elected, you know, you 
guys doing the same thing. She's taken on the banking and insurance right. industry. So, so one implication of this is if you want to do something about this or about 15 other important issues that we could be addressing, <laughs> we could put it narrowly, get involved with the coalition, but put it more broadly, get involved with organizations that are trying to educate and to mobilize voters. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I was say, we have the president of the voter registration movement during the civil rights era which was one of the most powerful pieces of getting all of that changed in the South. That's right. The voter registration movement, it wouldn't happen. That's right. And, and that's, by the way, the voting rights law that made it possible that ultimately that activity, one, that is then enabled black voting to go up enormously in southern states, is, is now threatened at the Supreme Court level. Yes. You were talking about income levels and how they vote or whether they vote and I'm not, I'm not sure how that bears out, <coughs> at least in terms of educational attainment. I'm trying to piece this together in my head so maybe you can help me. Because it seems like where there's less education, they tend to vote much more red in, in our state and in the rest of the country. And that tends to be more blue collar as well, obviously, less education is a lower job. So yeah. they kind of vote against themselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. We're just how do you explain that? Them. Is it just lack of edu education around the issues well, such as this? Well, the one thing I want to, oh, go ahead. Yes. Well, that was something that was mentioned to Marlene. What I found is, particularly among the lower income working class, that group becomes the perceived other. They're the group that's taking from them, and if I can do it, why can't they do it? Mm -hmm. It becomes this moral issue instead. Mm -hmm. Right. So there, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the concept of divide and conquer, yeah. right? How do you get this small group at the top that owns so much wealth and is getting wealthier and wealthier and wealthier, how does that group succeed in ma essentially maintaining its dominance mm -hmm. politically? Right? Not that they get everything they want, but they get an awful lot of what they want. Of and what top 1% now controls 40% yeah. of the wealth. Yeah, they've doubled their share of wealth over 25 years. Mm -hmm. And so we're back to the 1920s in terms of statistics. Yeah, and so you say, so, so we all understand that. How does he, how you do that? And one way is to pit groups off against each other. Mm -hmm. Some of that is racial. So you pit whites against blacks and whites against Latinos. Some of it, and also, when I say that, it also connects into immigrants and things like that. Um, but it's also, it's also class. So it's middle class versus poor, lower, versus poor or up, you know, people that are better off saying, I'm not getting this stuff, why should these people get it, mm -hmm. right? And because our benefit systems tend to be pretty skimpy in terms of the eligibility requirements, people, do, people who are struggling maybe not at, at poverty level, but they're, they're not that far from poverty, are not eligible for things that other people that are a little poorer than them are eligible for, and people resent that. And that's where you get the, a lot of the kind of the lower middle class anti-welfare push, but it's not just anti-welfare, it's this idea that the government doesn't care about me, the evidence, why aren't they helping me survive, mm -hmm. right? but they care about those other people, they're giving them an unfair advantage, and so people feel it's unfair. By the way, there's a lot of mythology involved with that too, because the reality is that the middle class gets more in terms of benefits from society than, than the poor do, and I'm gonna give you two examples of that real fast. One is in terms of public higher education. That's state subsidized. We know the state subsidy is declining, but the bottom line is it's still state subsidized. Who are the majority of students that come to community colleges and even more so to state or universities, right? Tend to be the middle, the upper middle class, right? Most of that subsidy is not going to the poor, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Another example is in terms of housing, I ask my students which are the most, well, are the largest housing programs in the country and people inevitably say section eight mm -hmm. and then they say public housing and I say no, those are number two and three, what's number one? No one has anything to say about that, but the answer is deduction for your home mortgage and interest payments and tax, property taxes. The deduction that you take for that, which is a middle class, upper middle class, and even upper class program, more so than for the poor, because most poor don't own their own house, right, ends up in total value being greater 
than the amount we pay out for Section 8 and public housing combined, right? So, but the bottom line is people do see certain things being, certain groups being eligible for programs that they are not eligible for and they resent that. And so it's, it's an opportunity then for politicians that are unscrupulous or media that are sensationalist mm -hmm. to play on that. And that's where we, and here we are. Ron. The thing that always bothers me about this entire concept is that these are, are real concrete strategies. They don't just happen. They're not byproducts of society that just is doing its own thing. These are things that are thought out in think tanks, thought out by mm -hmm. groups, whether they be political or religious or whatever groups they are, that work against, you know, against people. Basically. They don't yeah. just happen. Yeah. Well, the, the whole anti-welfare thrust, as I mentioned, came out of think tanks mm -hmm. and Republican strategizing uh, about how do we, right, and it goes back to Reagan. You remember the Reagan Democrat, yeah. right? That, the idea is how do we peel off a segment of the working class, right, that would normally vote their self-interest and have historically, at least back to the New Deal, but how can we peel them off by appealing to their sense of unfairness? Those people are getting something we're not. Yeah. And so they developed that strategy and initially, it was pretty much confined to the Republican Party, but as it took more and more hold, a lot of Democrats started to feel like, we've got to embrace that because otherwise we're going to lose too many, we're not going to win elections. And that's where, where uh, Bill Clinton and John Kerry came in. By the way, Ronald Reagan held up a picture of a black woman and said, this is the face of welfare. Do you remember that? Yeah. Do you remember him doing that? Still a hard Maybe sell. So many people think of Ronald Reagan as their grandfather, you know, whatever. Yeah. Yes. You mentioned the increase in wealth in the top. I was fascinated by the situation in Wisconsin where they tried to break the unions. And that was because the Koch brothers and others were funding that. And that's another thing that they're very well to doing. They want the unions broken completely. Yeah, I agree. The anti-union piece is a real big piece of this. And they knew that if they could reduce the percentage of people that were in unions, that they could in turn reduce the political influence of unions and the sway that unions had over their members. And so that went back to things like labor law that, that makes it very difficult to strike, makes it, allows employers to bring in strike breakers legally. You know, it goes back to the air traffic controller strikes right at the beginning of the Reagan administration. Yeah. It goes back to the, uh, in, the failure to pass labor law reform, yeah. which would make it more possible for unions to organize, even though we've had at times Democratic presidents and Democratic uh, Congress, the, the majority are not, are not willing to take a stand in favor of union rights, and that that has been a big piece mm -hmm. of this whole puzzle, no question. Okay, that goes to that declining middle class, Unions built the middle class. Yep. Yes, it did. And, and as unions are weakened, that's right. Yep. It's going down. By the way, way, if anybody, they should change. You want to go on that? That's a, like, they send you too many emails, but um, I'll put it on Facebook. They have the latest income inequality stats. There ain't no more middle class. It's really, it's, it's the whole thing is so skewed now. It's, it's scary. And you know, but we can't tax them. Can't tax them. No. Oh, no, no, because they might die. I want to thank uh, Dan for, uh, for uh, I think what the Senate has in mind to have, this is, you know, get, hear this research, have a discussion around it. Yeah. Very important. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. Yes, thank you. And, thank yeah, you. Yeah, we'll, uh, and I go downstairs and see what our. Audience.